It was back in 2019 when the word influencer was officially added to the English dictionary. And while influencers are those who exert influence over others by inspiring their beliefs or guiding their actions, it's also important for us to realize that the term influencer, it's typically used in the context of social media personalities who use their influence to generate interest in something by posting content on their platform. And if you're wondering how much influence these social media influencers actually have, Well, it'll help you to know that one such influencer, he's better known as Mr. Beast, he has more than 300 million subscribers. Think about that for a moment. This one guy, he's 26 years old, he calls himself Mr. Beast, and he's able to influence more than 300 million subscribers. Now, what 26-year-old named Mr. Beast should have this kind of influence? That's the real question here, right? And listen, this is just one of the many, many social media personalities who are able to influence millions of people who go and subscribe to their channels. And it's sad to say that many of these influencers are actually influencing their followers to embrace false doctrines, which are oftentimes in conflict with the word of God. And while it's true that the world of social media is filled with these influencers who are influencing their followers with false doctrines, it's also true that there are many social media influencers who are encouraging their subscribers to go ahead and live a life of sin, to to engage in all kinds of idolatry and sexual immorality and these sorts of things. And what this means then is that social media sites like TikTok and Twitch and Facebook and Instagram, these are sites that have become outlets for sin influencers who want to use their platforms to influence others to engage in all manner of sin. With that being the case, we should take a moment to examine our own lives by asking, am I allowing sin influencers to influence me or am I allowing them to influence my family? Am I allowing them to influence my children to live a life of sin? And if so, then the chances are you might be allowing sin influencers to lead you and your family in the wrong direction. Now, just to be clear, it'll help you to know that sin influencers, whether they're on social media or here in real life, you know, sin influencers are typically traveling down the wrong road. Secondly, we'll see that sin influencers are running the wrong race. Thirdly, and finally, we'll see how sin influencers are inspiring the wrong revolt. Now, with all that as the outline, let's open our Bibles to the little epistle of Jude. Here we find the brother of our Lord Jesus presenting us with three examples of Old Testament sin influencers. Now, as we make our way to the book of Jude, I want to take a moment to put our text back into its context. It'll help us to remember that Jude penned this epistle in order to exhort every Christian to earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. The reason why? Well, it's because there were, there were these ungodly influencers who were turning the grace of God into lewdness as they denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And now it's here in our text today where we find Jude, he's helping his audience to understand how these false teachers were following in the footsteps of three Old Testament sin influencers. And with this as the focus, let's consider the way that Jude explains this here in this little epistle. If you would look with me here, Jude chapter 1, it's verse 11 where he declares, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for a prophet, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now here in this verse, we find Jude, he's reminding his readers about these three Old Testament sin influencers, each of whom you were really perfect examples of the wrong way to influence other people. And Jude first mentions here Adam's uh, eldest son, whose name was Cain. He also then mentions a false prophet named Balaam. And finally, Jude refers to a rebellious Israelite named Korah. But now before we consider the way that these Old Testament men ended up affecting the lives of those they were influencing, we should first consider the warning that Jude presents to those who were following in the footsteps of those sin influencers. Knowing that those false teachers were defiling the flesh and rejecting authority and even speaking evil of dignitaries, Jude issues this word of warning as he declares, Woe to them. 
Woe to them. Now that word woe, it's translated from a Greek word, which can be traced back to the Hebrew word oi. You might hear someone say oi ve. You know, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Oi, it's a, it's a word that was awesome, uh, oftentimes used as a passionate cry of grief or, or a, a word of despair. And the, the same word was also used as an interjection de, de, designed to denounce something. And then there were also times when the servants of the Lord would use this word to pronounce a warning of divine penalty. Sometimes a prophet would say, woe to you as he was warning them about divine punishment. For example, it's in Isaiah chapter 5. There the prophet Isaiah declares, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine, Woe to men, valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the unrighteous man. The prophet Isaiah had no problem pronouncing these woes upon those who were living in sin. He pronounced these woes upon those who were calling good evil and evil good. He was pronouncing woes upon those who would take something sweet and make it bitter. And yeah, I do believe that the divine punishment of God should fall upon those who take something sweet and make it bitter. It's horrible. It's a horrible thing to do. But listen, the, the, the same can be said for the rest of the prophets. The, all of the prophets proclaimed woes upon those who were living in sin. They, they proclaimed woes upon those who were influencing others to live in sin. And they were, they were in this way, warning of divine judgment. They, they, and they were calling these woes upon false teachers who were leading people away from the righteous path of the Lord. I like the way that the prophet Jeremiah summed it up in the 23rd chapter of his book. It's Jeremiah 23, verse 1, where he declares, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Wow. That's an incredible woe given to false teachers who lead people astray. Christ Jesus was also known to use the same word and in the same way. As a matter of fact, you can read it for homework later. It's in Matthew chapter 23. There the Lord presents eight woes upon the religious rulers of the first century. The reason why? Well, it's due to the fact that they were hypocrites who were leading people astray. And while it's true that those religious leaders were teaching the laws of the Lord, it's also true that they were failing to apply the law to their own lives. And so they were hypocrites. It's for this reason that the Lord Jesus presented them with those eight woes in order to warn them about the divine judgment of God. And in similar fashion, Jude here is now presenting this woe to the false teachers who were following in the footsteps of Cain. Now, with all this in mind, let's consider the way that Jude puts it here in our text today. Notice again, we're going to back up and begin reading at verse 11. Here he declares, woe to them, the false teachers, woe to those false teachers, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Now, as I pointed out earlier, Cain is the eldest son of Adam and Eve. And while we don't know how many kids Adam and Eve actually had over the course of their lives, what we can say for sure is that Cain was their firstborn son. Not only that, but we also know that Cain ended up allowing his sinful desires to lead him down the wrong road. As a result, he became a sinfluencer, and he was influencing those who you know, were following him to, to, to go down the wrong road. I'm going to consider again how Jude puts it here in the beginning of verse 11. He declares, woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain. When Jude informs us that the false teachers were going in the way of Cain, this this word way uh, is based on a Greek word which was used in reference to a journey or a road that was being traveled. And what this means then is that the false teachers there in the first century, they were traveling on the same road that Cain traveled on. And just to be clear, we're not talking about the same literal physical road here on the planet. No, we're not, we're not talking about a literal road. No, instead, you know, Jude is using this word metaphorically in reference to a carnal course of conduct. It's an immaterial road based on the bad decisions of following, you know, sinfluencers. 
Now, in order to better understand the sort of sinful road that Cain had been traveling, we should take some time to consider the account that Moses presented in the book of Genesis. With that, I want to uh, turn our attention to Genesis chapter 4. So hold your place here in the epistle of Jude. Let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis 4. And, you know, as you make your way to the fourth chapter of Genesis, it'll help you to know that Moses here is presenting his account of the conflict that occurred between Cain and his brother Abel. As we consider the carnal path that Cain was traveling, I believe that we'll have a better understanding of the way that sin influencers actually follow Cain on the wrong road. With that, let's turn our attention to Moses' account found here in Genesis chapter 4. Look with me there beginning at verse 1. Here we learn that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now here in these verses, we find Cain and Abel, they're coming and presenting their offerings to the Lord. And while the offering of Abel was received, the offering of Cain was rejected. In order to understand why, well, it's important to notice that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. He brought the firstborn, which is to say that he brought the best. He brought the best of the best, or or, or the concept of firstborn means preeminent. He brought the preeminent animals before the Lord, and and he brought the, the, the best of the best in his worship of God. In contrast to this, we find Cain, he's bringing an offering of fruit, which had come from the ground. And, and that makes sense because Abel was tending the, the flocks while you know, Cain was working the garden. And so he brought the fruits of his labor. And there are some who insist that the Lord rejected Cain's offering because it wasn't an animal sacrifice. And with that, I would point out that there are many non-animal sacrifices, whether we're talking about wheat or, and grain or whether we're talking about oil and these sorts of things. There are more than just animal sacrifices found in the Levitical law. But at the same time, it's also important to understand that uh, you know, th- this offering was being presented before the Levitical law was even given. So that to then use the Levitical law as a basis for saying that's why God rejected Cain's offering, well, it doesn't make good sense. We're, we're mixing dispensations here. That being the case, I find it difficult to believe that the Lord rejected Cain's offering simply because it was fruit and not sheep. Some believe that Cain was guilty of offering God rotten fruit. Uh, That's possibly uh, what it means here when it says that he offered up the fruit of the ground. You know, and, and this could mean that he just offered something that grew from the ground, and that would make sense. But it's also possible that this was fruit that had already fallen to the ground and was already decomposing. If that's the case, then, you know, a possible explanation for why the fruit was rejected was because it was already beginning to rot. It wasn't the best of the best. It wasn't the preeminent fruit. It was just what's left over. And a lot of times we can offer God the offerings in the same sort of way. It's just kind of like, well, now that I'm done paying off all my bills and engaging in in my entertainment and doing the things that I, here's the little bit I have left for you, God. Here's what's fallen to the ground. Enjoy. And the Lord's like, yeah, I don't care about that. I'm not interested in your leftovers. He wants the the, the first fruits, the preeminent offerings, and he deserves that. So is it possible that Cain, you know, his offering was rejected because it was rotten fruit? It's possible, but we can't say for sure. What we do know is that Abel offered his, you know, uh, sacrifice to the Lord by faith, where Cain did not. We find this point in Hebrews chapter 11. It's verse 4 where Paul writes, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, 
he being dead, still speaks. Yeah, by faith, Abel offered God a more excellent sacrifice. It wasn't because it was sheep. It was because he offered it by faith. He presented his offering to the Lord with faith while Cain's offering was presented without faith. And knowing that it's impossible to please God without first trusting that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, well, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that the Lord rejected Cain's offering, which was given with the wrong heart. And further proof that it was given with the wrong heart is due to the fact that Cain got mad at God because God challenged him. Cain got mad at God because God corrected him. Not only that, but Cain was also jealous of the favor that Abel received from the Lord, as if the the Lord and Abel had done something wrong conspiring against him and these sorts of things. And so Cain was angry. And to understand how angry he was, let's turn our attention back to Genesis chapter 4. If you would look with me there at verse 8, here we learn that Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. That's how angry Cain was. He killed his own brother, but before he killed him, listen, we see here that Cain talked with Abel. In other words, he was attempting to influence his younger brother with carnal commands. As a matter of fact, the word talked found there in verse 8 It's translated from a Hebrew word, which in this context speaks of a threatening command, which is based on proud boasting. Cain was filled with pride and began to attempt to command his brother Abel to to go in a certain direction. And while we really don't know what Cain said to Abel here, what we do know is that he ended up leading Abel with his commands down the wrong road. He led him to the, to, the, to the field where his crops were growing, and it was there where Cain killed Abel with a heart that was filled with unrepentant anger. Now, with all this in mind, we should consider how the Apostle John described this sinful decision. It's in 1 John chapter 3 where the Apostle John declares, In this The children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. According to the Apostle John here, there's a clear distinction between the children of God and the children of the devil. The children of God are those who are traveling on the narrow path of righteousness, and on the path of righteousness, they learn how to love uh, their brothers and sisters in Christ. And and one way that we learn to love our brothers and sisters in Christ is to is to forgive them when they sin against us, and to and to care for them even when they step on our toes and these sorts of things. In contrast to this, the children of the devil are those who are following in the rebellious footsteps of Satan, who is a liar and a hater. And you better believe that those who are following in the sinful steps of Satan will become sinfluencers who are leading others down the wrong road that leads to their destruction. Now, this brings us to our second point because, listen, sinfluencers are not only traveling down the wrong road that leads to destruction, but sinfluencers are also running the wrong race. And with this as the focus, let's make our way back to the little epistle of Jude and let's take another look here at Jude chapter 1. I want to direct your attention back to verse 11 where Jude declares, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit." I want to stop here. I want to consider the second Old Testament example that Jude presents here to to these false teachers that he was warning with this word of woe. And while his first example of a sinfluencer was focused on the first son of Adam and Eve, the second Old Testament example of a sinfluencer was a false prophet named Balaam. Now, in order to better grasp the way that Balaam became a sinfluencer, we should take some time to consider the situation that took place during the days of Moses. And with this as the focus, I want you to hold your place here in the epistle of Jude. And let's turn forward in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. 
As you're making your way to the second chapter of Revelation, I want to take a moment to point out that Moses actually recorded the full account of Balaam in the book of Numbers. And so you can go and read that for homework. But to sum it all up, it'll help you to know that Balaam was a pagan prophet who was hired by Balak, the king of Moab. Balak wanted him to come and curse the children of Israel before they entered into the land of promise. And while it's true that the Lord forbid him from cursing the children of Israel, it's also true that Balaam ended up helping King Balak to become a sinfluencer uh, by helping him to understand how he could cause the children of Israel to stumble into sin. With that, I want to consider how the Lord Jesus explains this here in Revelation chapter 2. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 12, here Jesus declares, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things, says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's challenging the Christians who were at the church there in Pergamos. And one reason why is because they were allowing false teachers to come into the church and present the false doctrine of Balaam, who taught King uh, Balak from Moab how to stumble the children of Israel with idolatry and sexual immorality. In other words, the Christians who were there at the church of Pergamos, they were allowing false teachers to come in and become sinfluencers over others in the Christian community there by leading them to a life of idolatry idolatry, and sexual immorality. We must not fail to realize that Balaam ended up influencing King Balak with these false teachings because he wanted the worldly wealth that Balak had promised to provide him for his sinful services. And with all that in mind, let's make our way back to the book of Jude. I want to consider how Jude explains this here in our text today. If you would look with me again there at verse 11. Here again, Jude writes, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. As we take a closer look at this verse, we must not fail to notice here that Jude is warning these false teachers there in the first century about the way that they were running greedily according to the error of Balaam. The phrase run greedily is translated from a Greek word which in this context is being used metaphorically of a person's passion that leads them to rush into something headlong. You know, they're, they're, they're just running forward without really considering the error of their ways. They're, they're running so quickly that they're not even really looking at the ground before their feet, so to speak. And, and to put it simply, listen, the false teachers there in the first century were following in the footsteps of Balaam who placed personal profit over truth. He loved money more than truth. And, and therefore, he had no problem, you know, in, in the name of getting rich, misleading Balak into causing the children of Israel to stumble. I like the way that the scholars who created the New Living Translation rendered verse 11. They put it like this. What sorrow awaits them, for they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money. They deceive people for money, much like Balaam. The sinfluencers of the first century were willing to deceive people for personal profit. And it was there in Pergamos where the Christians were allowing these sinfluencers to come in and they were actually giving them money for their false teachings. And it's for this reason that they were all running greedily in the air of Balaam for personal profit. And just to be clear, It'll help you to know that the word error found here in verse 11, it's translated from a Greek word which is used of those who have the wrong opinion relative to morals and religion. So the sort of error that we're talking about, we're not talking about, you know, algebra errors or, or calculation errors or statistical errors. We're talking about religious error. We're talking about ethical errors. 
Therefore, the false teachers who were following in the footsteps of Balaam there in the first century, they were running the wrong race as they led people astray and as they were guiding them to run the wrong race along with them. I like the way, that, the way that the Apostle Peter explained it in 2 Peter chapter 2. There he declares they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. That's right. Shrek is not, only, not the only story with a talking donkey. The Lord literally used Balaam's donkey to rebuke him as Balaam moved forward with his plan to get rich quick by becoming a sinfluencer. And according to Peter, the false teachers who knowingly lead people astray for money, they have forsaken the way that is right for their own personal profit. And they're running the wrong race as they attempt to achieve a, a, a treasure uh, that they're hoping to receive, uh, all the while failing to realize that it just ends in destruction. Much like Balaam, who taught Balak how to stumble the children of Israel so that they might turn away from the Lord, Peter was warning the Christian church about the false teachers who knowingly lead people astray as they pursue the personal profit that's received by those who are running greedily according to the error of Balaam. And it's sad to say that the 21st century church is filled with these sorts of sinfluencers. That's right. We not only find sinfluencers on you know, secular you know, sites where, you know, Unbelievers are leading people astray with false doctrines. But listen, the 21st century church is replete with sinfluencers who are cashing in on false doctrines. And it's sad to say that there are many in the church who are running the wrong race. The reason why is because they're following after the false doctrines of sinfluencers. For example, there are many who are running the wrong race as they follow what we call prosperity preachers. You know who I'm talking about, whether we're talking about Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland or Trinity Denier T.D. Jakes. You know, these people who are making merchandise of Christians who don't know any better. They're making merchandise of Christians who are looking for, you know, a religious way to get rich. And as a result, many who love money, you know, they, they follow after these prosperity preachers who are leading them to run the wrong race. In similar fashion, the church is filled with those who rush to events like Life Surge Conference. Now, just to be clear, listen, the Life Surge Conference is just a new method for advancing the same old prosperity gospel. And according to the website, this conference provides Christians with, you know, instructions which will help us create a, and multiply financial resources for kingdom impact. Yeah, that they're getting together false teachers and entrepreneurs and comedians and these sorts of things that want to entertain you, but all the while making wealth one of the big points of the whole conference. And they want to help you to create and multiply financial resources, you know, for kingdom impact because clearly Jesus doesn't have enough money. And sure, I mean, Jesus, you know, lived on the streets during the days of his earthly ministry and didn't rely on a big budget and, and, and mega churches and these sorts of things. No, he just had a simple street ministry as he went from town to town preaching the gospel. But that's not good enough anymore. We need, you know, some sort of multi-level marketing so that we can get rich and then use that money for kingdom impact. Rather than simply fo focusing on the Great Commission, which, understand, what does it cost to accomplish the Great Commission? Nothing. Nothing. It takes you going out into the world, preaching the gospel message and leading people to Jesus. That's all it takes. You can do that at work tomorrow for free. But apparently, Life Surge Conference, the people want us to realize that we need to create and multiply financial resources for kingdom impact. With this as the goal, the conference features false teachers, motivational speakers, entrepreneurs, most of whom are just running greedily in the era of Balaam for their own personal profit. 
Because while they want to tell you how to create wealth, you know, in the name of Jesus, they're the ones really getting rich on this. With all this in mind, I encourage you to consider the instructions that Paul presented to Pastor Timothy. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. There he declares, now godliness with a plan for multiplying wealth is great gain. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's the wrong version of the Bible. Let me get back to the King James Version here. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Christian, listen. Those who desire to be rich end up running the wrong race. Why? Because they end up running a race that is designed to bring them to more worldly wealth. And in this, they fall in love with their money. Please understand that money in and of itself is not evil. Money in and of itself can be used for good or bad. It's the love of money that is problematic. And it's the love of money that lead many to stray from the faith in their greedy pursuit of worldly wealth. And while the sin influencers who follow in the footsteps of Balaam will be quick to assure us that, but yeah, we can use this for the advancement of the kingdom. I encourage you to realize that those who are led astray by their love of worldly wealth are not interested in building the kingdom of Christ. They're interested in building their own kingdom. And it's for this reason that they fall into temptations that trap us with the foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Listen, if the Lord wants to bless you with money, the money, the money in and of itself is not bad and can be used for the, the kingdom of Christ without a doubt. But when these so-called Christian leaders get you together in order to focus on you know, acquiring more wealth, that's where you got to stop and go, hold on a second. This is the wrong focus. It's the wrong focus. We are not called to pursue wealth. We are called to pursue righteousness and holiness. We walk by faith with Jesus Christ. And if he wants to bless us with money, praise the Lord. And if he wants us to be poor for the rest of our lives, that's up to him. But we need to focus on the great commission of Jesus Christ and take all of this love for worldly wealth and set it aside. And allow the Lord to provide as we learn how to be content. Now this brings us to our third and final point. Because listen, sinfluencers are not only traveling the wrong road. And sinfluencers are not only running the wrong race. But sinfluencers are also inspiring the wrong revolt. And to explain what I mean, let's make our way back to the little epistle of Jude. I want to focus your attention again at Jude chapter 1 verse 11. Here Jude declares, woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Here in the final section of this verse, we find Jude, he's pointing to this third Old Testament example of a sinfluencer. And he's here warning the false teachers there in the first century about the end of those who perished in the rebellion, which was led by a Jewish man named Korah. Just to be clear, it'll help you to know that Korah was an influential Levite who ended up leading a revolt against the divinely established priesthood, which was being led by Aaron. And to grasp the reason for Korah's rebellion, I want to consider the account that Moses presented in the book of Numbers. So hold your place here in the epistle of Jude, and let's turn in our Bibles to Numbers chapter 16. Now, as you make your way to the 16th chapter of Numbers, I want to take a moment to point out that this situation took place. This was during the days when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So this is after the exodus from Egypt, but before they actually entered into the land of promise. It was during that time when Aaron and his sons were consecrated by God for the purpose of serving the Lord in the position of priests. And and that's when Korah decided that he didn't really care for this hierarchy. 
He didn't really care for the Lord's decision to appoint Aaron and his sons to become priests while Korah and his brothers, the Levites, were you know, appointed to the supportive role of just helping the priests to accomplish all, all the duties and whatnot. And, and rather than submitting to the biblical instructions that the Lord had given to Moses, Korah decided that it was time to lead a revolt against Moses and Aaron, all in the name of equity. I want to consider Moses' account of this, which is found here in Numbers chapter 16. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 1. Here we learn that Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them, why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now here in these verses, we find Korah, he's leading this rebellion against Moses and against Aaron. And the reason why is because, according to his perspective, Moses and Aaron were guilty of exalting themselves above the rest of uh, of the assembly. Like Moses and Aaron were making much to do about themselves by putting themselves in these leadership positions over the rest of the assembly. And Korah here had come to the conclusion that Moses and Aaron were acting like they were greater than the rest of the Israelites. And so it was in the name of equity, you know, that that Korah comes along and he's just kind of like, well, you're no better than the rest of us, you know, and so we all need to operate at the same level. You know, we should operate as a congregation. Let's all vote together on all the decisions. And let's all, you know, make sure that we all have the, 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 the democratic say in the decisions that are being made and these sorts of things. And in order to establish this sort of so-called equity, Korah then rises up and rebels against the leaders appointed by the Lord. Well, in response to their rebellion, the Lord decided to punish them while simultaneously confirming the calling of Moses and Aaron. With this as the focus, let's turn our attention back to Numbers chapter 16. I want to skip down to verse 28. Here we learn that Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected who? Moses? No. Aaron? Uh Uh-uh. That they have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, verse 31, as he finished speaking all these words that, what do you know, the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the the assembly. In these verses, we learn about the way that the Lord punished those who rose up against Moses and Aaron under the sinfluence of Korah. And it's sad to say that those who followed the influence of Korah, they were buried alive after the Lord opened up the earth and swallowed them whole. And as we consider this horrific judgment, we'd all do well to realize that Korah He was not only leading his followers to reject Moses and Aaron. He was leading them to reject the Lord. And the reason why is because the Lord was the one who appointed Moses and Aaron to those positions of leadership. Moses and Aaron didn't exalt themselves over the rest of the assembly. The Lord put them in those positions of leadership. With all that in mind, I want to consider the way that that, that Jude sums all this up in his little epistle here. If you would, let's turn back to Jude chapter 1. I want to focus your attention again at verse 11. There again, Jude declares, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. 
That word perish is translated from a Greek word, which is used of that which is ruined and destroyed. This is the same word that Jude used back in verse 5, where he referred to the Israelites who perished after leaving the land of Egypt. God freed them from the land of Egypt, but then in their traveling through the wilderness, there were many who perished, including those who took part in the rebellion of Korah. They perished in the wilderness. To sum this up with simplicity, listen, those who took part in the rebellion of Korah ended up discovering that they were following a sinfluencer. They were following in the footsteps of a sinfluencer who was leading them on the broad road that leads to destruction. In similar fashion, listen, the world is filled with sinfluencers who are encouraging Christians to reject the leaders that the Lord has raised up. And while there are times when these sinfluencers are unbelievers who use their platforms to mock those who are actually submitting to our Messiah, yeah, there, there are plenty of unbelieving influencers who will mock Christians for coming to church and you know, giving to their Christian community and serving you know, rather than going out and partying and these sorts of things. But listen, there are also times when some of these sinfluencers are nothing more than disgruntled disciples who rise up from the midst of the Christian congregation and begin to lead a revolt with with carnal complaints, much like Korah. And much like Korah, there are those who use their influence within the church in order to lead others astray as they attempt to undermine the leaders that God has called and ordained. Knowing that this would be an ongoing issue in the Christian church, Paul actually took the time to warn the pastors from Ephesus about the rise of these rebellious influencers. As a matter of fact, It's in Acts chapter 20 where Paul declares, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. That's right, sinfluencers aren't always wolves dressed up in sheep's clothing. Sometimes they're congregants who use their influence within their own church to draw disciples away after themselves. And much like Korah, the Israelite who you know, took a stand against Moses and Aaron. There are times when these sinfluencers will use their complaints about leaders in the church in order to lead some sort of revolt within their congregation. They'll challenge the authority of their leaders as they present carnal questions about equity and hierarchy and how dare you think that you get to make these decisions and shouldn't we just have a, a, a congregational vote on, on whether we should do this or do that or, or if you don't vote the way I do or if you don't decide the things that I like then I'm going to stir up as many people as possible and lead them out the door. It happens in churches all the time. And knowing that these sinfluencers will divide churches, Paul encouraged the pastors from the church in Ephesus to protect the flock that the Holy Spirit appointed them to oversee. Christian, listen, if you find yourself being influenced by the complaining chorus in the church who rise up within our own congregation and, and, and try to you know, lodge accusations against those who are in leadership positions, I encourage you to remember the woe that Jude presented to false teachers who follow in the footsteps of Korah. And knowing that there will be sinfluencers in the church who use the argument of equity and, and, and as they reject hierarchy, they'll, they'll use these sorts of things. That we, we would do well to remember that the Lord is the one who appoints and ordains the leaders that he chooses. The Lord is the one who appoints and ordains pastors. And the Lord is the one who appoints and ordains pastors to raise up other leaders to help out, you know, so that the the hierarchy of the church can, can make sure that everyone's being ministered to. And with that being the case, it's important to understand that there are going to be times when leaders make decisions that you don't necessarily like. But that doesn't give you the authority to then become a Korah 
who walks around complaining about those decisions. Now, listen, don't get me wrong, because I'm not here to say that Christian leaders always get everything right. Of course we don't. I have not been right about every single thing. There was this one time where I thought I was wrong. Turns out I was actually right, but I was wrong about being wrong. So, No, but seriously, I mean, you know, I'm not going to make every decision exactly right. No doubt about it. Is the Lord big enough to deal with me? You better believe it. And listen, there will be times when you might feel led to complain led to question a decision that's been made. Well, make sure you go to the, wrong per- uh, to, the, to the right person and not the wrong person. If you have a complaint against a leader in the church, don't go to everyone else. Go to that leader. Go to the person that you have the complaint against and talk to them. Otherwise, you might be a Korah. And we see how that worked out. Rather than rebelling against the leaders that Christ has called to lead, let's instead become those believers who are actually engaging in the right revolt. What is the right revolt? Well, I'm I'm happy to get into this because, listen, I am rebellious by nature. I am rebellious by nature. I ran away from home. I dropped out of high school. I I shook my fist at, at law enforcement like... I just realized, you know, when I was presented with the gospel that I was engaging in the wrong revolt. I was engaged in the wrong resistance. I need to resist the devil. And so should you. I like the way that James explains this in the fourth chapter of his epistle. It's there where he declares, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures say in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. And what else? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your heart, you double-minded. Christian, listen. If you're following the sinfluencers of this world, then you have become friends with the world. We haven't been called to become friends of the world because because friendships with these sinfluencers will put us at odds with God. For this reason that James calls us to submit to God, and one way that we submit to God is by yielding in cooperation with the leaders that he's called to lead here within our Christian congregation. And as we submit to God, we should then also resist the devil. Yeah, we've been called to resist. We've been called to revolt. We've been called to rebel against the God of this age. And so we should. And one way that we rebel against the devil is by rejecting the sinfluencers who would lead us to follow in the footsteps of Korah. In this way, we'll also avoid the destruction that occurs in the churches where complainers are allowed to corrupt the congregation. And at the same time, we end up enjoying the grace that God pours out on those who will humbly yield in cooperation to the leaders that he raises up. Now, as we begin to wrap up this study, I just want to take a moment to remind you about a warning that Jesus presented in Luke chapter 6. He presents this parable by declaring, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? Wow. Whenever blind people follow blind people, they both end up falling into the ditch. And those who are following the blind sinfluencers of this world 
It's only a matter of time until they fall into a spiritual ditch. The reason why well, it's due to the fact that sin influencers, they are traveling the wrong road as they follow in the footsteps of Cain. Sin influencers are running the wrong race as they follow in the footsteps of Balaam. And sin influencers are inspiring the wrong revolt as they rebel against the authority of the Lord, just like Korah. With all that being the case, I encourage you to realize that it's only a matter of time until those who follow the sin influencers of this world find themselves in a spiritual ditch. And I don't care if your influencers are on the left of the political aisle or on the right of the political aisle. Listen, if they are leading you with unbiblical doctrine, they are leading you into a spiritual ditch. Without debate, the world is filled with influencers. The world is filled with people who want to influence us. And they use their platforms and their positions to lead others according to their beliefs. We better make sure that the beliefs of the people we allow to influence us actually line up with the Bible. You see, whether we're talking about the influencers that we find on social media or here within the local community or even here within our Christian congregation, we must realize that there will be those who are trying to influence us with sinful ideas. They're nothing more than influencers who will lead us astray as they walk us straight into the ditch. For this reason that I encourage every Christian in closing, we need to make sure that we are following influencers who are actually following the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the way that Paul put it when he declared, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul was saying, hey, I'm following Jesus Christ, and so follow me as I follow him. You see, it's not wrong to have influencers so long as those influencers are actually being influenced by Jesus. And if you want to avoid the woes that come upon those who follow the unbiblical advice of sin influencers, then I encourage you, we need to follow those influencers who are living under the influence of the Holy Spirit as they walk by faith with Jesus Christ.